Okay, so your book wants to talk about um, new products and then talk about um, uh, managing existing products. Um, I think that perhaps the, the place to start when we start talking about products and product management is with classifying products. First, a couple of quick quotes. Customers assess the fir your firm's value to them through the products and services you offer. So, you know, so a company like Buick isn't got anything to do with the people at Buick or anything else. It really has to do with your view of their products. Same thing with Honda or Toyota or one of those companies. Merle Crawford, a famous um, uh, writer in the area of new product development, said a successful new product does more good for the organization than anything else that can happen. Uh, think about um, uh, the, the you know the introduction of the of the first iPhone or even the iPhone 8 um, as a new product. Um, what about a new product failure? Is my comment. Um, new product failures probably are not quite as damning as 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 the positive aspect of a new product. Uh, but in some cases, product failures um, signal the end of a of a of a business and and the organization around it. So, what is a product? Well, a product is any need satisfying offering. A product is anything that can be offered to satisfy a want or need, including physical goods, um, services, persons, as in political campaigns, places, as for instance, marketing Las Vegas. Experiences, for instance, you know the uh, NASCAR experience. Organizations like um, United Way and the um, uh, National um, um, uh, uh, Cancer Association, and ideas. The key with any product is providing something the customer wants and needs, and therefore values. There are two foundations associated with product management. One is the marketing concept. That is identifying unmet wants and needs, produce, identifying, uh, identifying and developing a, a good service or experience that meets those needs and meets the organization's objectives. The second aspect of product management is this whole concept of the exchange paradigm. Remember in the very first chapter, I talked about the idea that that marketing was the science of exchange. And this exchange paradigm talks about what gets exchanged. If you do not have something that customers want, need, and value, they're not interested in making an exchange for it. And therefore, no sales take place and the product is a failure. Product classification schemes. There are a number of different product classification schemes. Your book brings to, uh, talks about a couple of them. I'll bring up another one or two. Uh, the first one your book talks about is a classification scheme of durables versus non-durables. This is the, the distinction between a good or service that is uh, not used up as it is as you as you experience the product. So, for instance, an automobile is a durable good, a refrigerator, a lawnmower, uh, clothing, um, things that, um, that even though you experience them and you use them as a consumer, um, they don't get used up in one or two um, uses. A non-durable good then is something that is used up as you experience it. Gasoline, food, um, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that are non-durables. And then, of course, the third item in this classification scheme would be a service, which is a which is the ultimate non-durable good because it is used up even if you don't experience it. And uh, an example would be uh, an empty seat on an airplane. You know, I am you know um, if you if if that airplane takes off and the seats are empty, that service is gone even if no one actually consumed it. The distinction and the reason that we talk about class, this particular classification is because people tend to think about durable goods differently than they do non-durables and services. If you make, and, and, and this comes down to the, the, the idea that if I buy a durable good, I have to live with it for a significant amount of time. So if I, if I do a bad job of picking a particular shirt or a pair of shoes or um, a lawnmower or an automobile, and it's and it and it does not turn out to be what I expected. Um, I end up having to deal with that for quite a period of time, and as a result, individuals tend to spend more time shopping and more time thinking about 
um, purchasing durable goods. Non-durable goods, on the other hand, may be just as expensive. For instance, a vacation may cost as much as an automobile. But the thought process uh, that goes into it tends to be uh, not quite as uh, not quite as lengthy. The evaluation is different, and then and the you know and find it, one of the kind of neat things about a non-durable is, uh, you know, if I have a if I you know if I have a bad meal, it's a bad meal. Uh, it's over. Uh, it's past, and I move on to something else. And of course, we're going to talk about services in a, in, a, in a couple of lectures from now. Another approach to classifying products is what's something called shopping effort. That is, how much effort is the consumer willing to to um, make um, to secure the product? And this comes down to convenience goods, which, of course, um, uh, consumers would use the least amount of uh, effort to obtain. And then shopping goods, specialty goods, and then unsought goods where, where in fact, not only do they not spend any shopping effort, they actually wait for the goods to come to them. So let's talk about each of these. Convenience goods are goods that an individual will buy the alternative that happens to be available. Um, an example of things that are, that are typically considered to be convenience goods are items that you would find at a convenience store. And so if you think about a convenience store, convenience stores all carry staples. They carry the, the three basic food groups of all of uh, sustainability. That is, they carry bread, milk, and beer and soft drinks. Um, and so they, they do carry um, um, staples. Now, which staples do you buy when you go to the store? Well, the answer is... Uh, at a convenience store, if I'm not, if it's a convenience good for me, I'm just there to buy bread. I'm just there to buy milk, and I'm just there to buy beer. And I don't really, and, and the brand is not as, as, and the brand is not as important. And I'm not willing to spend a lot of sh effort shopping for it. A second kind of convenience good is an impulse good. This is something that you suddenly just decide that you have to have. And of course, um, uh, if you go to a convenience store, the goods that are the closest to the cash register tend to be the most impulse oriented. One of the favorite impulse goods at a convenience store tend to be sunglasses, but there are lots of others. Um, you know, um, um, beef snacks and chewing gum and all the other sorts of things that you find close to the cash register. And then finally, another convenience good is an emergency good. This is where you really just absolutely have to have something. For instance, you have a, a splitting headache and you need, and you need um, uh, aspirin. You simply are willing to buy whatever aspirin are available. All right, and so if you think about, about shopping effort and convenience goods, convenience goods are goods that people are not willing to spend much time and effort for, but in fact will buy whichever item is available. As a result, the key to success for convenience goods is wide distribution. Why? Well, because people buy the one that's available. So if people are buying the one that's available, you want to make sure that yours is available at every conceivable location. The next type of good is called the shopping goods, and there are two kinds of shopping goods. One's a homogeneous shopping good, and the other is a heterogeneous shopping good. A homogeneous shopping good is a good that consumers see as the same except for price. An example of this might be something like alkaline batteries. Um, we go to the store and we look at, we, we're looking for batteries, and there are three or four different brands of batteries. But we basically think that all the batteries are, most of us would say the batteries are all the same. And as a result, what do I tend to do? I tend to look for um, the, the brand that I can get the best deal on. So consumers see these products as basically the same except for price, but they're willing to spend some time and effort shopping for price. You know, I think batteries are a really good example of this. Of course, what are the key then for these sorts of, of um, products? Low cost distribution, that is making sure that you can get the product to the consumer at the lowest possible cost. And then good manufacturing so that you can produce high quality products at the lowest possible price. And so it's cost controls, it's manufacturing costs, and it's low cost distribution. 
Now, heterogeneous shopping goods are different from homogeneous shopping goods because consumers see these goods as differentiated and are typically looking for combinations of product attributes and features at the best price. An example of this might be, for some people, uh, a big screen TV. And so what they're looking for is screen size. They're looking for picture resolution. They might be looking for... Um, um, uh, internet readiness they might be um, uh, Wi-Fi they might there might be a number of things that they're looking for and and of course what they're what consumers are doing is they're they're willing to trade off one feature for another and so these and these are sort of goods that people spend a lot of time shopping for so they'll go to the store and they'll compare five different brands of, of TVs maybe different ranges and sizes maybe different ranges in terms of um, uh, surround sound and speaker quality, maybe in terms of picture quality, maybe in terms of um, whether or not they are um, um, they are um, Wi-Fi accessible. And so the key when you're doing when you're talking about shopping goods, of course, is product differentiation. Trying to produce a bundle of attributes that you think provide the best value for customers. Uh, next are called uh, next product category is called specialty goods these are goods that consumers see as highly differentiated to the point that they that they do not perceive other brands as substitutes and will not accept or buy other brands and so they they are willing to go through a large uh, a, a, a huge amount of effort to get a very specific product this is the ultimate goal for most marketers they want their product to be con considered to have no substitutes to be the the ultimate product with no substitutes coca-cola tries to get you to believe that there are no substitutes for coca-cola it's the real thing um, pepsi tries to get you to believe that there are no substitutes for pepsi um, and and for some of us that's true that the, you know, if if coca-cola is not available we won't we won't drink pepsi um, and for those people then even something like a soft drink might be a specialty good now the, the idea behind this is that all companies wish that their brand had that much power that it was so unique in the mind of the consumers and positioned so well in the mind of consumers that people were willing to go to great lengths to, find, to, to, to buy their product. Now, the key to success in, uh, in managing specialty goods is to manage the product uniqueness. And that is make sure that whatever it is that makes our product unique is shielded so that so that new competitors don't come in and try to take that position away from us. Now, when we think about these these goods, um, there is a uh, oh, so, that, so the fourth version of these goods is called an unsought goods. These are goods that people will not seek out. Instead, they expect these goods to find them. An example of this for people who live in Las Vegas might be things like water softeners, solar screens, solar panels, um, window tinting, um, you know, things, that, landscaping, things that you don't really have to go out and, and look for. Somehow those people find you. And of course, if you're in that kind of, an, a, a kind of a business, the key to success is prospecting. Now, when you think about these four different kinds of shopping efforts, um, there's a little bit of what's called a Pygmalion effect here, and that is if you believe your product is something and you manage it like it is a, is a shopping good, then customers are likely to perceive it as a shopping good. The other part of the problem with shopping effort is what is a convenience good for you might be a shopping good for me and especially good for someone else. An example of this might be something as simple as a bottle of water. Is a bottle of water a convenience good or will you only buy three or four different brands in which case it's a shopping good or is there only one brand of water that you really want to drink and you really will only buy one brand of water and then for you even water is a specialty good so it's a little bit uh, more problematic to try to market your goods based on this but it is important to understand this way of classifying products uh, another way to classify products, uh, business, uh, business to business products is um, industrial products is to, is to think about them and you know and remember this idea of drive demand, whether they are installations, accessory equipment, raw materials, component parts and materials, supplies, and professional services. And your book talks a little bit about these. And once again, 
much like uh, much like products, the idea behind doing these sorts of classifications is to understand that for many companies, the way that they purchase these different kinds of products varies. Uh, and then finally, what I wanted to talk to you about was a benefit sought approach to classifying products. And this isn't in your book, but I think it's very important. And this was this has been around for quite a while. And this argument is is that is that products provide three different kinds of benefits. That is, some benefits that products supp uh, uh, um, supply are functional benefits. These are benefits that solve consumption-related problems. They solve problems, they prevent problems, they resolve conflict, they remove frustration. So be an example of this is a, a product that is a stain remover. It is primarily a functional product, right? Because it's designed to solve a very specific problem. I have a stain in my shirt or a stain in my carpet, and this product is designed to solve that problem. Or I have a problem, my teeth aren't white enough. Oh, well, then maybe the, uh, the, the, the product that, that, uh, that, that you see on the shelves might be something that is a teeth whitening product. Once again, functional benefits. Second sort of benefits that some products have are called symbolic benefits. These are benefits related to self-enhancement, role position, group membership, ego identification, self-image maintenance, etc. These are benefits associated with the visibility in the product and the way that people see you when you possess and use that product so you know so you know so there's you know so some people own a rolex wristwatch well the wristwatch you know maybe five six seven eight thousand dollars it doesn't keep time dramatically better than than other wristwatches a little bit better maybe but you can buy a wristwatch that keeps very good time for $30. And so part of the value of owning and wearing a Rolex is to have other people see that Rolex on your wrist and, and say, that person must be important or successful. They own a Rolex. The third sort of uh, uh, benefit is are called experiential benefits. These are benefits related to sensory um, uh, pleasure or phys or cognitive stimulation. These are products that stimulate the mind or body. Um, the ultimate experiential product is probably a scary movie, uh, where you go to the movie and you you know, and the whole point behind the movie is to cognitively stimulate you and scare you. Uh, another example might be something like a roller coaster or any other product or service that in fact provides you with either mental or physical stimulation. Now the interesting thing about this is that almost all products have a little bit of each of these. For an example, think about an automobile. Well, automobiles have functional benefits in terms of safety, reliability, uh, miles per gallon, those sort of things. Some automobiles have a number of symbolic benefits associated with them. For instance, driving a Mercedes is, is, is probably symbolic. Or perhaps driving a, a Prius uh, or a hybrid automobile might be uh, symbolic that you are concerned about the environment and are interested in conserving uh, fossil fuels. And then if you think about automobiles, many automobiles are experiential. I don't know how many of you actually own an automobile that's fun to drive, but the fun part of driving an automobile is the experiential part. All right, and so an automobile, some automobiles are mostly functional. Some automobiles are functional and symbolic. Other automobiles are functional, symbolic, and experiential, with maybe the emphasis on experiential. Here's another, an, another example. This might be something as simple as getting a haircut. You know, you can go to the store, you can go down to Supercuts and get a haircut, and that's mostly a functional experience. You might go to a high-end barber shop that your friends recommend, and maybe the part of the benefit of going to that particular place is that people see you there, and as a result, it's a symbolic benefit. And then finally, you know, I my particular barber shop is is like a three-ring circus when I go there. It's always sort of live entertainment. So when I go there, uh, for me, it's a very experiential. Um, uh, haircut that is it's really sort of mentally and cognitively stimulating when i go to the barbershop both the conversation and the activities that take place there